Hello friends, welcome back to my new video lecture. In this video lecture, I will talk about one of the four pillars of romantic age. But before I move ahead, it is my humble request that if you like my YouTube channel, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and press the bell icon so that you receive the regular notifications as soon as I upload any information on my YouTube channel, you are the first one to receive the notification. So please do press the bell icon. And as you can see here, you can also follow me on Insta, Facebook, as well as Twitter. The details are here of all the three. Now you can see the details, Facebook, Insta and Twitter. You can follow me and you can support me. Now, let us start with our new video today. I would also like to request you all that if you do have some valuable time of yours, please ensure that you watch till the end of this video because this video is a very informative one. And today's video that I will be talking about is, I'll be talking about P.B. Shelley. When we talk of P.B. Shelley, the first thing we, that comes to our mind is he is one of the four pillars of Romantic age. When we talk of P.B. Shelley, we also uh, get reminded of his revolutionary kind of attitude that he possessed and which he showcased to some extent in his various categories or genres of writing. In this particular video, my dear friends, I will try to give you a complete information about P.B. Shelley's biographical details and his works. Please ensure that you take out some valuable time of yours and watch till the end of this video. P.B. Shelley, if we start, let us start with P.B. Shelley's timeline. As you can see on your screen, P.B. Shelley basically was born in 1792 and he died unfortunately in 1822. So he died very young. He was born on 4th of August 1792 at West Sussex, England. His father, Timothy Shelley, was a Whig member of Parliament. P.B. Shelley's mother, Elizabeth Pilford, was a Sussex landowner. So basically, P.B. Shelley belonged from an uh, economically very well-off family. P.B. Shelley's cousin and lifelong friend, Thomas Medwin, recounted Shelley's early childhood in the work called The Life of P.B. Shelley. Shelley entered in Eton College in 1804 and he did not do well. He was very maltreated by his seniors or the older boys and the seniors when they maltreated Shelley and the incidents that happened of his maltreatment, these seniors called these incidents as Shelley Bates. As a result of the tortures that P.B. Shelley uh, suffered from his older uh, boys there, he did not basically participate in any games or co-curricular activities at Eton. And because of that, he could not participate. He became a little bit introvert kind of and he did not participate in Eton College activities. This earned him a nickname called Mad Shelley because sometimes of the psychological traumas and sufferings which Shelley suffered at the uh, hands of his elder colleagues or students. That created a lot of psychological scar, which sometimes resulted in, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of outburst, emotional outburst, which was not according to the norms of the society. And so, so he, he was given this name called Mad Shelley. And his independent spirit, his spirit of independency at Eton also won him another name called the Eton Atheist. Now, his first publication 
my dear friend his first two publications basically uh, let us work uh, talk about his first publication that is uh, his, his 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 first publication is a gothic novel and that novel is the strozzi this was published in london in 1810 by john wilkie and john robinson and this was published anonymously with only the author's initials uh, with pb now one of the reviewers who reviewed this work of zestrozzi was of the opinion that zestrozzi is one of the most savage and improbable demons that ever issued from a diseased brain that was the review Next, uh, Shelley published his poetry collection. It was known as Original Poetry by uh, Victor and Tsar, uh, 1810, under the pseudonym of Victor. In 1811, Shelley published his second Gothic novel. That no, Gothic novel is St. Irwin or Rosicrucian. And this word under the pseudonym of gentlemen of the University of Oxford. This particular second novel, it derives its genre from Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Gregory Lewis. Some are of the opinion that uh, this novel might have also been influenced by William Goodwin's Saint Leon, A Tale of the 16th Century. This novel tells the story of a man who desires for the elixir of life which ultimately leads him to make a compact with the devil. In 1811, along with Thomas J. Hogg, something very important happened. We all know about it, so let us just recapitulate. His accompanist, Shelley's accompanist was Thomas J. Hogg. Shelley and Thomas J. Hogg wrote and circulated a pamphlet and that pamphlet is very famous, we all know, it's called The Necessity of Atheism. This was done when he was at the University College Oxford and this is also considered most probably to be the first England pamphlet or English pamphlet uh, which professed atheism. As a result of this publication of this pamphlet, this pamphlet caused enormous fiction with the authorities and we all know Shelley asks the college authorities to discuss with him the subject he openly asks them that if there is an issue discuss with me however this was completely met with indignant refusal and Shelley was asked to follow the college norms and the college rule of faith which Shelley refused bluntly as a result of which we all know Shelley as well as Thomas J. Hogg, they both were expelled from the college. On 28th of August 1811, same year, around four months after he was expelled, Shelley was expelled, he eloped with a 19-year-old uh, girl. Uh, sorry, he eloped with a 16-year-old girl. This time, Shelley was 19 years old and he eloped with a 16-year-old girl called Harriet Westbrook. Harriet Westbrook was a tavern keeper's daughter. Mind you, Shelley belonged from a very aristocrat family. Now, what is the background? How did Shelley come to know about Harriet? Harriet studied at the same boarding school as Shelley's sister. And Shelley's father had forbidden P.B. Shelley to see her, basically. Harriet Westbrook. Now, Shelley's marriage with Harriet Westbrook, it, it ultimately turned out to be a very big disaster and it ended abruptly. In July 1814, Shelley again eloped to Switzerland and this time with Mary Goodwin. Who was Mary Goodwin? Mary Godwin was the 16 years old daughter of the famous William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, after their elopement, they eloped and they stayed around six uh, weeks, moved around from place to place. They again returned to England, homesick and without any money, penniless. Now, on 30th December 1816, Shelley and Mary 
Godwin, they formally got married. After their marriage, they formally started living in the village called Marlow, which is in Buckinghamshire, where Shelley's friend, Thomas Love Peacock, lived. Shelley started, during this time, Shelley started active participation in the literary circle. And he came in contact with people such as Leg Hunt. And during this period, he also met uh, John Keats. During the period of 1816 and 1817, Shelley wrote radical pamphlets under the pseudonym of the Hermit of Marlowe. In 1822, the liberal, a periodical, which was, this was started by a combination of three people, Shelley, Byron and Leghunt. And this was started as a counterblast, counterblast to the two, uh, to the Tory magazines called the Blackwoods magazine and the Quarterly Review. Shortly after starting of this general, on 8th of July 1822, which is less than a month of before his uh, Shelley's 30th birthday, Shelley drowned while sailing back from Ligon, that is Livorno, to Lerici in his boat called Don Juan at the Bay of Spezia. Shelley's ashes were put in the Protestant cemetery near Rome, near an ancient pyramid in the city walls. His grave bears the Latin inscription, very important, Cor Cordium, that is Heart of Hearts. Later, a memorial was, was created for Shelley at the Poets' Corner at the Westminster Abbey. We all know Westminster Abbey is very famous, where along with him lay his friends Byron and Keats. So, this was a slight biographical details, my dear friends. Now, let us talk in details about the works of Shelley, right from his beginning till the end. I have tried to arrange it chronologically and I also tried to give you some information about almost each and every work. So, please focus and pay attention and if needed, you can write these works. I have tried my level best to give the most accurate information available. Let us start with his work. His first work, Zestrosi, we discussed in 1810. It's a Gothic novel followed by his original poetry by Victor and Tsar. Uh, 1810. Uh, this was written under the pseudonym of Victor and uh, then followed his second Gothic novel called Saint Even or Rosicrucian. This was uh, written under the pseudonym of Gentleman of the University of Oxford. Now Saint Erwin or Rosin uh, Crucian basically tells the story of a man who desires for the elixir of life, I discussed this earlier also, uh, and this for this elixir of life, he uh, makes a deal, a compact with uh, with the devil. Followed by his fourth work, the necessity of atheism, which is a pamphlet, of course. In this screen, you can see, my dear friends, I have used inverted commas for poems, essays, and uh, such kind of writings, pamphlets, and in the bracket, I have given the genre of writing. And if it's a collection of a book, I have used italics. So if it's not a collection of book or if it's not the name of a novel or the collection uh, anthology, name of an anthology, individual works, be it uh, an essay, be it a poem, be it a pamphlet, I have put it under inverted commas and in the bracket I have given the genre of writing for your easy understanding. Now, this necessity of atheism, which of course uh, is a pamphlet, this was co-authored by Thomas J. Hogg, we discussed it, led to the expulsion of both of them from the college. And I also said that this is most probably the first English pamphlet uh, which professed atheism, followed by his fifth work called The Devil's Walk, which is a uh, devil's work, a ballad, a poem basically, in 1812. It consists of seven uh, irregular uh, stanzas of 49 lines. The poem basically is a satirical work and the criticism of the British government. In this poem, 
Saturn is depicted as meeting with the key members of the British government and the poem is modeled on and meant as a continuation of the devil's thought which was written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1799 Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Robert Southey in 1799 this was followed by his sixth work called an address to the Irish people which is a pamphlet in 1812 this was during his uh, stay in in Dublin basically Catholics in Ireland has always been second class citizens for centuries now in in 1800 uh, there was an act called the act of union which passed and which gave the catholics uh, a little bit of rights and a minimal representation of the catholics in the parliament now shelley is this particular work called an address to irish people it calls for the agitation to revoke this act of the union Followed by his uh, next important poem called Queen Mab, which was published in 1813. It's a philosophical poem divided into nine parts, dedicated to his wife Harriet Westbrook. This work is basically a work which attacks dogmatic religion, government, industrial tyranny and war. Followed by his next work called A Refutation of Deism which was published in 1814 it's a dialogue developed this position a refutation of uh, deism which is a dialogue basically it purports to defend christianity against deism but this also presents a very strong case against both christianity and deism and in favor of atheism followed by a, one of the very important works by shelley Alster or the Spirit of Solitude published in 1816 which is a poem this is also considered to be a spiritual autobiography the title of this poem ladies and gentlemen was suggested by Thomas L Love Peacock it's a long poem of 720 lines following blank verse Leghan praised this poem in the December 1816 issue of his uh, of his journal called the examiner However, this poem was attacked by the contemporary critics for his obscurity. This poem Alster also influenced Keats in writing his Endymion. William Butler Yeats's uh, The Wanderings of Oisin was also influenced by Alster. These, these are important informations from any competitive examination point of view. So if you feel, please do jot it down, write it down. His next work called the Mont Black, where a line written in the Vale of Shamuni. This poem uh, talks about the highest mountain in the Alps called the Mont Blanc. Uh, this is an ode which compares the power of the mountain against the power of human imagination. This is the crusk of the, of the work followed by his next work called the hymn to intellectual beauty the genre of this work is an ode published in 1816 it's a 84 line ode followed by it it was influenced by rousseau's novel of sensibility called julie or the new heloise and it was also influenced by william wordsworth's odes intimations of immortality next comes his next poem called Leon and Cynthia or the revolution of the golden city a vision of the 19th century which was published in 1817 this is important my dear friends because this was re-edited and uh, uh, written as named as the revolt of Islam in 1818 basically attacks religion uh, depicts two uh, important characters the incest of two important characters that is a brother and a sister now let us talk about the revolt of Islam this particular work was re-edited I told you revolt of Islam re-edited from Leon and Cynthia or the revolution of the golden city revolt of Islam basically is an attempt to write an epic poem uh, following the style of Edmund Spencer's uh, the fairy queen although the title talks about the revolt of Islam but the poem have basically nothing to do with Islam in particular Followed by his next very famous poem called Ozymandias, 
in 1818. It's a sonnet. Now, the interesting part is, my dear friends, this is the title of two sonnets, Ozymandias. And both the sonnets are published in 1818. And both are published by two different writers. One is by P.B. Shelley. The other is by Horace Smith. The subject of both the sonnets are the same. And why are there so many similarities? It was because there was a competition between these two poets to write a poem on the same topic, same subject, but different forms with different imaginations and different subject. Uh, the subject matter will be same. The, you know, uh, the name would be same, but the representation would be different. So this was a small competition between these two people. And that is why this particular poem has two, two, two sonnets, this particular sonnet. It is written by two different people with the same title and same theme, same subject matter. Shelley's Ozymandias was published on 11th of January 1818. And this was published under the pen name of uh, Glyrestis in the examiner, like Hunt's examiner. And Smith's Ozymandias was published in one month later, that is in the 1st February 1818. In, in the same uh, weekly paper, the examiner. Just to recapitulate, my dear friends, examiner is the weekly paper, which was founded by uh, John and Leg Hunt in 1808. You would recapitulate in my video on John Keats also, I talked about the examiner. This particular sonnet deals with the statue of an Egyptian king. If we talk about antiquity, antiquity-wide, Ozomindis was a Greek name for the Egyptian pharaoh called Ramesses II. This is followed by Chenchi, 1819, a verse drama. Ozomindis is followed by Chenchi, a verse drama. This is basically a tragedy in five acts and is inspired by a real Italian family, the house of Chenchi. Uh, basically, the theme theme of this drama is incest and uh, parasite and uh, due to this theme the the play was not performed in the public in england until 1922 followed by his next work called peter bell the third this is a satirical verse this verse basically parodies uh, william was was peter bell and contains the famous line hell is a city much like london Next is the work, as you can see on the screen, The Mask of Anarchy, which was published in 1819. This is a poem written on the occasion of the Pitaloo Massacre. The poem has, Pitaloo Massacre is something important, please research. The poem has 372 lines and it's a large four line quatrains, followed by his next work called The England in 1819. This is a sonnet. England in 1819 is a political sonnet. And uh, this particular sonnet reflects Shelley's liberal ideas, ideals. This was inspired uh, by Shelley's indignation in regard to the condition of England at that time. The king which Shelley refers in the poem is basically King George III. Next is one of the very famous poems by Shelley. It's a sonnet, Ode to West Wind, 1819. Ode to West Wind was, was written near Florence in Italy. Some are of the opinion and they believe that the poem was written in response to his son, loss of his son. He lost his son, William, who was born to Mary Shelley in 1819. This poem allegorizes the role of the poet as the voice of change and revolution. Followed by his next work called A Philosophical View of Reform, 1819. It's a political essay considered to be Shelley's longest prose work. It is meant to address the political developments in, of England at that time. Shelley advocated the non-violence and moderate response to the rep rep repressive measures which the British government took. This is also, this particular work also has a background of the Peterloo massacre which he addressed and which occurred on Peterloo massacre occurred on 16th of August 1819. Next is one of the very famous work by Shelley called Prometheus Unbound. It's a verse drama, four act lyrical drama. This was written in Italy. It's a closed drama. We all know what a closed drama is not intended to be produced or performed on the stage. It's concerned with the torments of the Greek mythological figure called 
Prometheus. We, we can recall it. Prometheus defied the gods and uh, gave uh, fire to humanity for which he was subjected to eternal uh, punishment and sufferings at the hands of Zeus. This work can be considered to be a masterpiece of Shelley and was a reply to Achilles' uh, Prometheus Bound, followed by one of the very famous poems by Shelley called To a Skylark. It's a poem was inspired, this was published in 1820, uh, was inspired by an evening walk in the country near Livorno in Italy. This poem consists of 21 stanzas made up of five lines each. The four lines are metered in trike, uh, trimeter, the fifth is the iambic hexameter, also called the alexandrine. Uh, the rhyme scheme of each of the stanza is A, B, A, B, B, followed by his next poem, which was published in the same year, 1820, The Cloud. This is considered to be one of the major poems by Shelley. The poem consists of six stanzas in anapestic or antidactylous meter. Basically a foot with two unascended syllables followed by an ascended syllable. The cloud basically is a metaphor for the unending cycle of nature. Followed by his next work called Oedipus Tyrannus or Swell Foot the Tyrant. This is a drama, basically a satirical drama which talks about the trial for adultery of Caroline, the estranged wife of King George IV. This particular work can also be considered to be uh, the only comedy written during the Romantic period, followed by his next work called A Defense of Poetry. Defense of Poetry was written in 1821. Basically, it's an essay. This essay was written in response to his friend's Thomas Love's Peacock work called The Four Ages of Poetry, which had been published in 1820. In this particular essay, Shelley presents a philosophical analysis of the role of the poet followed by his next poem called Adonis. Adonis is a very famous poem published in 1821. It's a pastoral elegy, which we all know most the death of his uh, friend John Keats. This poem consists of 495 lines in 55 stan Spenserian stanzas. It was composed in the spring of 1821, just after the death of uh, John Keats. Keats in this poem is portrayed as Adonis, the Greek god of beauty and fertility. Now, one more point that is important is other poets such as Chatterton, Sidney and Lucan are also mourned in this particular poem. This poem attacks the Tory critics because of their hostility towards Keat. Byron is referred as the pilgrim of eternity in this poem. Next is Epipsychidion, which is subtitled published in 1821, subtitled as Verses Addressed to the Noble and Unfortunate Lady Emilia V, now imprisoned in the convent of this was written, uh, the background was uh, the, oh, the 19 year old Teresa Viveni, who was the daughter of the governor of Pisa. Uh, she was imprisoned in a convent by her family. This is basically an autobiographical poem, uh, autobiographical in the sense that it basically talks about Shelley's search for the eternal image of the beauty of women. Followed by his next work, uh, which next work and the last work ca called The Triumph of Life. This is a poem published in 1822. This is considered to be the last major work of P.B. Shelley. The, the work was left unfinished. Influence of Dante's Divine Comedy and Petra's Triumphy can be seen. It's written in Terza Rima. It's a dream allegory which explores the nature of being and reality. My dear friends, this is all for this video lecture on P.B. Shelley. I hope I was able to give you detailed information about uh, the works of Shelley. This particular video uh, definitely will help you from var for various competitive examinations. Thank you very much for sparing your time. If you like this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and press the bell icon so that you get the regular notifications. Thank you once again for taking out your valuable time and watching this video till the end. This is Dr. Shoikot Banerjee signing off for now. Thank you very much for watching.